Thank you. Thank you for coming. First off, um, does everybody have something to write with? Anybody need a pencil or anything like that? Good. Okay, um, next thing we'll do, I'll uh, pass out, pass out to you uh, a copy of the handout materials for what we're going to do. I, I look at what we're going to do today as having like three aspects to it. One is, I'm going to talk to you about the background of atomic theory, a little bit about that. And then um, I'm going to pre-lab with you over a laboratory activity we're going to do. And the equipment in front of you on the benches is the equipment we're going to be using in the lab. You're actually going to be working in the dark. Uh, the dark in this room is pretty good. We're going to shut the lights down when we actually start that activity. And uh, there are flashlights so you can see what you're doing so you don't bump into each other, that kind of thing. You can write down the data as you're working today. As Wendy said, I'm a chemistry professor here at Jackson Community College. I teach uh, basically a form of general chemistry, and I also teach organic chemistry. The lab activity that we're going to use today is one that I, I wrote about 25 years or so ago. And it involves, um, I use it in the uh, general chemistry courses that I teach. Now, what we're going to talk about is atomic theory. And I'm going to go over a brief PowerPoint presentation for you. I don't want to bore you with this thing, but I think I can show you some things that you might find interesting about atomic theory. First off, as we look at the historical development of atomic theory, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that it actually started out as a philosophy. And when we talk about philosophy, we often think of the Greek philosophers. And when you think of the Greek philosophers, a couple things you need to keep in mind about them. The ancient Greek philosophers existed a long time ago, 2,000 some years ago. And in their society, most of the work that was done in their society was done by enslaved peoples, by slaves. So their attitude was, if somebody's doing this and they're slaves, that's below us. And they felt that knowledge is gained by pure thought was somehow better than the knowledge actually gained by getting your hands dirty and doing something. That's one thing that you have to keep in mind. Now, when you think of the Greek philosophers, who do you think of? What kind of name comes to mind? Archimedes. Archimedes. Other names, too. Aristotle. Plato, Aristotle, those kind of things. And this right here is Aristotle, uh, a bust of him. Of course, they did not have cameras back then. I was going to tell you that was his graduation photo, but it's not. But uh, anyway. Aristotle had two major contributions to chemical chemistry and atomic theory, atomic thought. One of his contributions was he said that all matter in the universe is composed of four elements. And those elements are earth, air, fire, and water. Now when you think about this, if you're sitting around just thinking about it, you could probably come up with a way of saying that everything in the universe is somehow made up of these four things. Air, earth, fire, and water. This is a meter stick here, and it's composed of wood. It came from a tree. If this was Aristotelian times, and we were subscribing to his philosophy, could you tell me what elements are in this meter stick? Earth. Why would you say that? It grows out of the earth. Grows out of the earth. OK, grows out of the earth. What else is in it? Come on, somebody else. What else is in it? Water. Why would you say water's in it? What do you got to do with the tree? Water. You got water, right? Okay. It's also fiery because if I put a match to a piece of wood, it burns and the fire comes out. So it's got fire in it. This is how the philosophy works. And after you burn a tree or burn this wood, what are you left with? Ashes. Ashes. That's the earth. Okay. And so now take that substance, take that substance and compare it to something like a concrete block. A concrete block is made up of elements also. Tell me what elements are in a concrete block. Sand. Sand, which is a form of dirt. These, these elements. Yeah. Earth. Okay. Concrete block also has what in it? Water. Water. It's got water. You've got to mix it to make some mortar and stuff. Does it have any fire in it? When you go to light a block, does it burn? No. No, there's no fire in it. Okay, and so you can explain anything in the universe, supposedly using those four elements. Now, we know there are more elements than that now. We've got a periodic table of 100 some elements up here. But back then, that was the thought. The other thought that he had was that all matter is infinitely divisible. It works like this. See this 3x5 
five card. If I take that card, I can tear it in half. Then I can take that half and tear it in half again. Then I can tear it in half again, tear it in half again, tear it in half again, and I continue, I can continue to do that conceivably forever. In his world, all matter was infinitely divisible. Infinitely divisible. We could do that forever. Two of his students, Democritus and Leucippus, differed with him. Their philosophies differed with his. They said there's a point at which matter can no longer be subdivided. And they called that point atoms. Guess what word we get from that? Atoms. That's what the word atoms comes from. Now, this was 2,000 years ago, about 400 BC. We really didn't see a published development in atomic theory until sometime in the 1800s. But the people of those times had an understanding of the atomic nature of matter. And the reason I would make that statement was because I read a number of years ago, I read the abridged journals of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And there was a point where they were camped in the western part of what's now the United States. This was a heck of an expedition at its time. It occurred around 1804. And um, the captains, Lewis and Clark, they slept in tents, whereas the men slept on the ground under brush shelters and crap like that when they were out. And there was a big storm came through the area, and one of the sergeants woke the captains and said, get out of the tent. There's a tree about to come down in the tent. They got out of the tent, the tree came down and smashed the tent and would have killed the two men in the tent. In Lewis's journal, he stated that had we remained in the tent, we would have been smashed to atoms. And that term, that term atoms, was used in 1804 in his actual journal. Now, we did not see anything published on atomic theory until about 1808. And there was a gentleman by the name of John Dalton. That's his photograph, the lithograph of him right there. John Dalton, a little bit about him, he was not a great experimentalist. What he was known for doing, he was known for taking other people's work, looking at the work that they did, and interpreting it in a new light. He read the work of Sir Robert Boyle. And Sir Robert Boyle was the person that said that the gases act like little tiny spheres moving through space. He read the philosophies of Aristotle and Democritus and Leucippus. And from Democritus and Leucippus, he got the term atoms. And he developed the first published atomic theory. Something else about John Dalton. John Dalton was supposedly a brilliant man. My understanding was that at the age of 12, he became a school teacher. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I've got a 14-year-old son. I don't want him teaching anybody anything. <laughs> and at 12, this guy's teaching school. The other, the other thing I knew about him, reading about him, was that uh, he had only one hobby. It was long old. That's something that he really enjoyed, I suppose. Anyway, he published a book called The New Ideas in Chemical Philosophy. And in his book, New Ideas in Chemical Philosophy, he proposed the first atomic theory. One of the precepts of that theory was that each element is made up of tiny particles called atoms. So he used the term from the Greek philosophy. The atoms of a given element are identical. Atoms of different elements are different in some how and some fundamental ways. Chemical compounds are formed when atoms combine with each other. A given compound always has the same numbers and types of atoms. Water is always H2O. It's got two high atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. And then lastly, chemical reactions involve atoms reorganizing with each other. These things, we've got something of an understanding of already. But what Dalton did not have, Dalton did not have a great deal of experimental work of his own to support this. He was interpreting someone else's work. We didn't know what atoms were like in 1808, except stuff was made of it. Okay? Then, in the mid-1800s, somebody developed what was called a good vacuum. And I'm not talking about a Kirby for taking the crud out of the carpet or anything like that. I'm talking about the ability to take a container and evacuate it, remove the gases from a container, so the container had nothing in it. And this guy right here, uh, this guy by the name of Crooks, uh, William Crooks, I actually have it sitting on my desk, my friend, right in here. And sometimes uh, when I get you guys started in lab, I can grab it and show you. I have a textbook written by him. Um, in 1848, he uh, discovered something called the Crookes discharge tube. 
This textbook I have, by the way, I, I found it at a, um, I was working for a company one time, and they were revising these laboratories, and they had me go in and clean up the labs, and I found this old book sitting on a shelf there, and I asked the people the company where I have it, they said, sure, thank you, it's just a piece of junk. But it's written by him in the 1800s, and it's a chemistry book. So I think it's pretty interesting that I have it. Anyway, this thing here is called a Crookes Discharge Tube. I've got one right here, and I want to show you this Crookes Tube. Here's how the Crookes tube works. It's an evacuated container. It's got two electrodes in it. It's got an electrode embedded in this side and an electrode embedded in that side. Inside of here, there is an aluminum backing with a screen. The screen is covered with a material called zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide is a material such that when charged particles hit it, it glows. It's called scintillation. It gives off a green glow. You're going to see this in a second. What Crookes did was he took it and put together one of these tubes and he hooked up, let me sit down. He hooked up to the tube um, a power supply that gives off lots of holes. And what I've got here is such a power supply. This thing right here in my hand, this thing's called a Tesla coil. Now a Tesla coil puts out about 50,000 volts of electricity. And the reason why I know it puts out about 50,000 volts is because it takes 50,000 volts to send a one inch spark through dry air. It's a little bit humid today as I look outside, but I can get about a one inch spark out of that thing. So this thing here puts out about 50,000 volts of electricity. I'm going to put it to the Crookes tube here and I want you to observe it. Okay, see those rays right there? When Crookes saw this, they called these things cathode rays. Didn't really know what they were. All he knew was that it went from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. And these ratings he observed, he published his work at the time. Anybody that was doing science at that time read his work, thought, man, this is a toy. I've got to have one of these. It's like the latest DS or something that little kids have to have, right? Okay, got it, and they put it in their lab. They didn't know what they're going to get from this thing, but they knew they had to have it. They stuck it in their lab somewhere. Usually they hung heavy dark canvas, black canvas in the area, to keep things away. Um, to keep the light away so that they could darken that area. And when they did this, the work that they would do when they had some spare time, they'd go back and replay with the thing, try to see if they could come up with something from it. They also, if they were involved in scientific work, they were also publishing their work at the time. In order to publish, you have to take photographs of things. And photographs nowadays, kids, their only understanding is they got digital cameras. But for those of us that are older, have you ever taken a picture of a child? with an older camera and had the child come up and say, show me the picture. Yeah. If you still have an older one, then you're going, no, it's uh, got to get developed. But nowadays, it's <coughs> right? Well, back then, photography was done on photographic plates. They were glass plates, they big or so. They were wrapped in heavy dark paper, and they were covered with a silver bromide emulsion. And when the light hit it, you got a negative image, and from processing, they could process a positive image. These plates, again, when they were shipped from the manufacturer, were, were wrapped in heavy brown paper. They were usually stored in a dark cabinet somewhere. If you got yourself a Crookes tube in the mid 1800s, stuck in your lab somewhere, you had a cabinet nearby where you kept your photographic plates, people started finding that their photographic plates were exposed. They would take those plates, they would send them back to the manufacturer with a letter of complaint. There was one German by the name of Wilhelm Rankin, who said, you know, I've been buying these plates for years from the same manufacturer. They've always been good. So what he did was, he set up a crooks tube, and he called his wife, said, come here, man. Hold your hand here. He had his wife hold her hand up there. Took a photographic plate, put it up on the other side of her hand, turned the crooks tube on, and then took that plate and had it up. And December 22nd, 1895, Bill Hamrick, and this is the image you saw. This image right here. You see the ring on your hand? Okay, see this image right here? This image was taken in the United States. Um, Michael Apopoli, who was the physician, was at Columbia University in New York City. And this image was taken on January 2nd, 1896. Somebody spent a Christmas break 
I'm on some work. Somebody got hurt over Christmas break. That's a shotgun pellet. It's a shot in the hand. The person who owns that hand asked the physician, hey, before you go in and start digging those things out of there, can you figure out where they're at? And that's the first medical diagnostic x-ray taken in the United States on uh, January 2nd, 1896. Can I tell you something about that? When that image was taken, um, you know, it saved a, somebody getting their hand dug up pretty bad. And although, I mean, that looks like it hurts. There's another picture of the image there, especially the, the shot pellets on the knuckles there. Look like, God, that hurt. But anyway, um, the uh, state of New Jersey, across the river from New York City, they banned x-ray machines. And the reason they banned x-ray machines was because in the minds of the New Jersey legislators at the time, it was obscene to be able to image, to see inside the human body in that manner. Now, when we think about that now, we think about medical imaging and stuff now, we think how silly it is for the state of New Jersey to have passed such legislation back then. But something you need to keep in mind, that throughout human history, it has always occurred, and I would suggest that it always will occur, that our technological capabilities will constantly outstrip our moral understanding. We see the same things nowadays. We have the ability to keep people alive whose quality of life we would question if it was us. We had a physician in this state. Yes? Nuclear abilities outstrip our ability to, to morally do some practice, as shown by the Cold War and the creation of nuclear bombs. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Definitely did. And that will always happen. Our technological capabilities will outstrip our morals, will outpace our morals, and always have in this world. Uh, Got this thing here. This is a fluoroscope. I found this at uh, Colorado um, University. And what this shows, this maybe I will go right there. This little image right here. You can take this and you hold it over this image of a hand and you can actually see fluoroscope x-ray type image what they get from that. Okay, that was 18, uh, 95, 96, 1897. That's the name of uh, Sir John Joseph Thompson determined the charge to mass ratio of the cathode rays. What Thompson did in his work, he took these cathode ray tubes and he set up a magnetic field around it. And he also set up an electrical field. And when he set up the electrical field, it looks something like this. If you take these rays, here's a cathode ray tube here. It's got a couple of electrodes, <coughs> and it's hooked up to love, lots of volts. And when you hook the thing up, you see these rays go from the negative electrode over to the positive electrode. If you set up another set of electrodes either side of this, make one of them positive, make the other one negative, these rays will deflect away from the negative electrodes and they'll deflect toward the positive electrode. If something's attracted to positive and repulsed by negative, how charged does that something have? Negative to negative charge, right? So then what uh, Thompson did was at right angles to this, he set up a magnetic field. And then he set up some potentiometers and he balanced the two fields so that the rays, instead of curving one way or another, they went straight in. And they did a whole series of calculations that involved mathematics we're not going to get into called calculitis, calculus. Calculitis is the word for disease. But, uh, and uh, he calculated the charge to mass ratio of those particles. And for that, he's given credit for the discovery of the electron. And he proposed something back then that they called the plum pudding of model of the atom. Now, you got to think about what's happening. We're starting to figure out a model. We're starting to figure out a theory, an explanation for how the matter in this universe is composed. And from his observations, what we have here is we've got a positively charged goo, and embedded in that goo, like plums and plum pudding, are these negative things called electrons. 
And it was called the plum pudding model. The Adam, nowadays we probably call it the chocolate chip cookie model. And if this was in the late 18, early 1900s, and this was a chemistry lecture, that's what I'd tell you Adam's were like. Simpsons or something like this. 
this, rather than the plum pudding model, the model that we're going to use is more of a planetary model, where you've got the nucleus at the center, and somehow we've got these electrons that go around. This next slide I'm going to show you, oops, excuse me, 99, Robert Millikan, another American, uh, discovered uh, the uh, uh, charge, the actual charge on an electron. And he did something called the famous oil drop experiment. He had a cover on a drum, and he took an atomizer, like a perfume thing, spritz it, and he spritzed some oil into here, and then he hit it with some x-rays, so that those drops of oil would lose uh, charged particles and become charged themselves. He allowed the oil droplets to fall through a hole in this, and he set up a couple of plates, one positive on the top and negative on the bottom, and then he balanced those charges and watched it through a microscope. And he went through thousands of these little particles that were falling, balanced their charges, and actually calculated the fundamental charge of the electron. This little table here shows a little bit about something that most of us probably already heard. How many of you, especially little kids here, have you heard about atoms before? No? Yes? Okay. The parts of atoms are the protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons have a positive charge. The electrons have a negative charge. The neutrons have no charge. There's a joke that goes with that. The neutron walks into a bar. It goes to order a beer. Bartender, uh, bartender serves up a beer. The neutron reaches into his back pocket to pull out his wallet. The bartender looks at him and says, no, for you there's no charge. <laughs> Shadows, see the shadows in the 
fat puppets over there, the cabinets? That's because these dark suckers aren't powerful enough to suck the dark out of those areas. I was telling that story one time to a high school class. I taught high school for a period of seven years. And as I was talking about the quantum theory of light to my class, the students were getting a little confused by it. I said, we don't want to go through it. the dark suckers there. And this one little girl sitting in the back of the class, she raised her hand, she said, Mr. Singer, there's no such thing as a dark side of theory. And I told her a bit about the things like that. How many of you have ever changed the older style light bulbs, light bulbs that look like this? Notice when you change those light bulbs, they have a dark spot on them, right? That's because they're full. When they get full of dark, you throw it away, you get a new one. All right? And then <clears throat> she raised her hand again, she said, Mr. Singer, you're making that and I said, no, I'm not. Think about this. Before we had light bulbs, what did we have? What did we have? For light bulbs, candles. When you blow out a candle, what color is the wick? Black. That's where all the dark goes. At that point, she raises her hand again. She says, Mr. Singer, I know you're making that up. And at that point, I had to admit, I said, yes, I know. That's not the funny part. The funny part was there's a kid sitting back here in the back of class. He raises his hand. He says, Mr. Singer, I said, yeah. He said, were you making all that up? I said, yeah. And I look, and he starts to erase it. even taking notes on it. So, okay. <laughs> now, the dark sucker theory, you can look that up. If you Google it on the internet, you can read about it, that kind of thing. The only thing I tell you is, if you Google the term dark suckers, be careful which websites you go to. <laughs> I'll let you think. Now, for most of you, sometime in the sixth grade or so, or sometime in your grade school, later grade school, you probably studied um, atomic theory of some kind. And we use now something called the quantum mechanical model of the atom. This model explains how the electrons arrange within an atom. What you have is you have energy shells. How many of you have heard these terms before, the term shells? Okay, now it's a term that we use for the energy levels or shells. And the reason why Neil Bohr came up with the term, and the reason why we did was because after um, Rutherford discovered the nucleus, we proposed something called the planetary model of the atom, which says the electrons go round and round it, and that's kind of the model that we use for younger kids all the time. The problem with that model is that you take a charged particle and you put an orbit around another, it gives off energy. And somebody's calculated that it would take like a billionth of a second for all the electrons in the universe to collapse their nucleus. And then the entire universe would collapse something like that. Yeah. Um, I learned that they're not Perfectly like circular orbits because they, um, because as they turn, as they're going around, they're trying to go on a straight path, so they're losing energy as they turn yep. in the circular path. Yeah, and so the problem is, yeah, you can't have, you, you would have to emit energy. Now, that being the case, the whole universe would collapse to something like the head of a pin in a billionth of a second. Maybe this universe would exist. It's not the head of a pin in another universe. I don't know. But uh, so far, we don't, we don't think that's what's going on. And Niels Bohr proposed that instead, the energy of the electron is quantized. Now, the term quantized means only certain energy states are allowed. Now, if only certain energy states are allowed, we've got systems in this world that have only certain energy states allowed. For instance, if I bring in a ladder and I lean it against the wall here, there are rungs on the ladder. I, as a man who being, can step from the floor to the first rung on the ladder, and I can exist on that rung, but I don't exist between the rungs of the ladder very long. If I step from the first rung to the second, I will have more energy than I had at the first. If I jump from the first rung to the ground, that energy is transferred to the floor in my legs. If I jump from the top rung, there will be more energy. Same thing with the atom. Also, some of you, how many of you have ever driven a manual transmission automobile or a lawn tractor or a, or a full side tractor? How many of you have something like that? Some of us have, right? You can only go so fast in first gear, right? And if you want to go faster, you have to shift to second gear or third gear. That system, too, is quantized. There are only certain energy states that are allowed. Now, Within energy levels, there are sublevels, and within sublevels, there are things we call atomic orbitals. And the definition of those is there are regions in space which represent the high probability of locating an electron. This photograph right here is from the Solvay Congress. It was taken in 1927. This is one of my favorite photos ever. 
ever. This is everybody who was alive at the time that was doing the work on the time period. They got together for the same conference. And you know they party. Okay, first, here's Marie Curie, for instance. You recognize this guy, don't you? Einstein, right? Okay, I have no idea what he's looking at. Alright? Uh, should have been looking at the camera, though. But anyway, uh, they were all there. Same conference. Alright. Yellow handouts. Who doesn't have one? Is everybody got one? Okay, we'll go over with you if you would like. This thing here, you've got to be careful with it. It's got two electrodes. 
there's a spring at the bottom, there's a ceramic cover on these things, and there's a metal electrode at the top. This thing right here is called a spectrum tip. This one happens to be filled with hydrogen gas, the same stuff that Niels Bohr observed. I press this down here, I release it, and I allow it to come up. As it come up, it contacts that electrode there, and when I turn this thing on, don't look directly at the light, but look at it with the rainbow glasses. You're going to see a discontinuous spectrum. And what you'll see is you see there's a very faint violet line, then there's like a turquoise line, and then these fine lines you can barely find, and then a red line. Okay, those lines are the lines that Niels Bohr observed, which you get to be to the quantum mechanical model of the atom, our understanding of energy shells. Now, here's what you're going to do. Is you are going to determine the wavelength of those lines. And the way we're going to do it is with the apparatus that's set up in front of you. That apparatus, take, a, take your printed materials there, do the same. There's an image of it right there. I've got things set up on the books with that. But it looks like this. You've got two meter <coughs> sticks, and those meter sticks come together at a right angle right here. And there's a spectrum tube. I'm looking down from above the spectrum tube there. And there's a diffraction gradient here. What we're going to do is we're going to take, this is an eyeball here, look through this, and you're going to look at the image to the right side of the power supply. Now, when you go to set this up, you've got another meter stick here you can use for measurements. What I want you to do is I want you to take this power supply and I want you to put it at the very end of the vertical part of the T there. And I want you to make sure that this is the right angle here. You get something square to fit in that corner. You can eyeball it, get it as best you can for the right angle. And I want you to take your spare meter stick, there's another meter stick here, and I want you to measure the distance from the center of that tube to where the diffraction gradient is. And I want you, as good as good as you can, best you can, to make this distance 100 centimeters. That distance right there, I'm going to try to make that 100 centimeters. And now, I know there's some younger kids here and stuff. I want you to help me with some of the math in this, because some of the math's going to look a little weird. But we're all going to be able to work through it. I'll help you with it. We're going to call that distance in algebra, we're going to call that the y distance. Okay. Now, Here's how you actually do the experimental work. Sit anywhere you like. And how you actually do the experimental work is like this. You're going to look, have one person look through the diffraction gradient from this end, and you observe the light over here. There's going to be a purple, uh, turquoise, and a red light somewhere out there. And then another person takes a pencil, holds the pencil vertically, a lot of meter stick, and get somewhere right and show you this. Holds the pencil vertically along the meter stick and moves it along until the person looking through the diffraction gradient says stop. When that person says stop, you're at the location of the light. You can turn on a flashlight and see what you're doing. And I want you to record that distance that you measured that. And where that gets recorded, there's a place on the third page. Place here, and that's going to be your x distance. So these distances from here. Here is the x distance. Now, what we're going to do, I think, for purposes today, we'll just do the hydrogen spectrum. I've got hydrogen two job here. We'll do the exact same type of work in the experiment that Niels Bohr did. Measure the x and the y distances. And then what we're going to do, I've got a computer lab reserved for us. We're going to go over to WA120. And that's in the library uh, building next door here. And wait till everybody's done with their experimental work, it's got those three measurements done. It's not going to take us long to do it. It's going to take you about five or ten minutes to do that. Get done with the experimental, uh, the experimental work, and then we're going to go over to WA120, and we're going to process the data. But in order to process the data, I want to talk to you about the calculations. So I want you to take some notes on this here. So go to the last page of the printed materials. That's the page that has the data sheet. And where it says there, it says, 
Um, the value of z is calculated as follows. All right. The um, what we need to do is we need to calculate this distance from here to here. And that's the z distance. Now. These are unknown. They're right triangle. If you know the two legs, the right triangle, the two shorter legs. Now, what magic way do we get the longer one? Yes. Pythagorean theorem. Another Greek guy. Right? Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem says z squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. How do you solve that for z? Take the square root. So in your little notes there, the z squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Put the square root symbol over the top of the x squared plus y squared. Z is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Like I said, if this mathematics is complex, that's okay for especially for the younger kids. I'll help you through it. <coughs> now, another branch of mathematics called trigonometry. The branch of mathematics called trigonometry, what we need to know is we really need to know this angle right here. And that angle, we're going to give it the Greek symbol theta. We need to know that angle right here. It's called theta. And so we're going to use, uh, from trig, we're going to use the sine function. The sine of angle theta is equal to the opposite side of the hypothesis. Exactly. Now, from our illustration here, what is the opposite? X. And the hypotenuse is Z. Z. X over Z. <coughs> so the sine of angle theta is equal to X over Z. Okay, and then we're going to use something called the Bragg equation, which is developed by somebody by the name of Bragg. It says the wavelength of the spectral lines is calculated as follows. The symbol right here is the wavelength. That's equal to something called D times the sine of theta. We're going to have that sine theta thing. We need to know what D is. D is the distance between the lines in the diffraction gradient and, hold on a second. I, 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 I didn't calculate it. Normally I have my students calculate it, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to give you that value. I think it's 1.97 by 2 minus 4. I'll crunch it. I'll have it for you before we're done here today. I'll have it. And I'll give you a value for you. Um, and then when we get over to the computer lab, we're going to actually process this in a spreadsheet. We'll actually process it. So here's the, here's the contest thing. I'd like you to work in groups of, say, 3 to 4. So you can get together 2, two to 4, anyway, uh, in here. and. Because you're going to need to work with each other, help each other out. Much of the setup is put together. Make your measurements or set things up so you get your right triangles as best you can. Let's do this. I have a prize for the team that is closest to the pin. I have two calculators, two scientific calculators. And this would be for the team, when I say the team is closest to the pin, this is the team that comes closest to the accepted wavelength of the red line of the hydrogen spectrum. So the accepted wavelength is 656.3 nanometers. So here's the deal. Uh, get your setup, make your measurements. We'll go to, when we get done with that, we'll go to the computer lab. You'll calculate the wavelength and whoever, and don't back calculate to figure out what your measurements over there, it's <laughs> to figure out what your, what your measurement should be. You got to go by your legitimate measurement. The team that does, they got two calculators for that too. So go ahead, uh, get set up, and get started. I'm going to grab my calculator. I'll be right back.
What? Yeah, we have to do that. Okay. So everybody, uh, a couple things. One, this is this is that Crooks uh, textbook I was telling you about. It's uh, Selected Methods of Chemical Analysis, written by uh, William Crooks, and it's uh, dated 18, so 1894. Okay, one of the things that you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get the uh, spectral tube out. Oh, I that. Are you Okay, I'm going to Let's have the key to the front of the I need something off this diffraction green. That's not the one. Thank you. 
two point eight. Right there now. Right there now is a nice five solar. Somebody else, somebody else down here do that. Okay, your first number should be in the neighborhood of somewhere between 20 and 30 for the red, for the purple line. Stop. Go right. Go to your left. Stop. Right there. Yes, what do you get? That's about right. Yeah. It's a purple one. Purple one is the one I've been reading first. I'm sorry. Um, 20, between 20 and 30. That's blue. Purple or blue, whatever you perceive it as. Okay, is everybody about done? No. No? Okay. Yeah, I ran out of calculator. <laughs> <laughs> we need a real calculator. I figured out. I figured out. Yeah, square root to get to get um, the Z over the first one. Um, my, 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 my